I'm Julie Zenner along with Dennis Anderson and here's what's coming up on Almanac North. Well, it's the cold, flu and now COVID season. We'll talk with the doctor about what vaccinations you should have to help your immune system. We'll introduce you to two indigenous artists and see their art on display at Duluth's Eco Building. And we'll preview a new PBS North documentary and also find out how you can help Truckers for Tots reach their goal. Those stories and voices of the region up next on Almanac North. Hello and welcome to Almanac Nora. Thanks for watching. And Denny, it's good to be back after my week away. Yeah, nice to have you back. You enjoyed your time off a little bit there? I did. Got good. to spend some time with the grandkids. That's and, always uh, fun. Have a little bit of a throat tickle to... To prove it. To prove it. Okay, <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> but let's get to the headlines. All right, thank you very much, Julie. Well, the St. Louis County Board has scheduled two public meetings for residents to give input on the 2024 county budget. The first meeting is this coming Monday at 7 p.m at the County Courthouse in Virginia. The second meeting will be Monday, November 27th at 7 p.m. in the St. Louis County Courthouse in Duluth. Now that meeting will also be live streamed on the county's Facebook page for those who can't attend in person. The annual Give to the Max Day on Thursday raised more than $34 million for Minnesota nonprofit organizations. The 15th annual statewide giving campaign raised money for 6,600 nonprofits and schools. PBS North and the North 103.3 FM raised $3,400 for programming. Thanks to all who gave. The local Salvation Army is suffering a shortage of bell ringers for the Red Kettle season, putting their fundraising goal in jeopardy. Now, so far, the Army's about $3,000 behind where they were at this time last year, threatening their $225,000 goal. To contact the Salvation Army if you want to volunteer as a bell ringer. And the holiday season kicks off in earnest this weekend in the Twin Ports. The Christmas City of the North Parade runs down Superior Street in Duluth tonight. And then the annual Bentleyville Tour of Lights at Duluth's Bayfront Park opens for the season on Saturday. The holiday season is also a time when cold and flu cases pop up as family and friends gather in close quarters. And though the COVID-19 pandemic is behind us, COVID is likely to stay with us for years to come. Joining us with some tips to stay healthy is Dr. Andrew Thompson, an infectious disease specialist with St. Luke's here in Duluth. Welcome, doctor. Thanks for being here with us tonight. Uh, are vaccinations something, doctor, we should be having annually? Yes, we should. Um, for a while now, flu shots have been recommended for all people annually. Um, and this year, uh, there's a, also COVID booster is recommended for all. And RSV vaccine is recommended for some uh, groups of people. What is RSV? RSV is a virus. Um, and it's particularly bad for the very young, for infants, and for older uh, individuals, and those who might have immune problems. Mm -hmm. But it causes a bad, it can cause a bad pneumonia. Mm -hmm. What are you expecting this year in terms of respiratory illnesses in our area? I never like to predict. <laughs> um, Do it anyway. <laughs> we can reliably uh, expect that there will be some influenza. We're already seeing a few cases of influenza in Minnesota but it's hard to know when it will peak and when activity will be particularly bad. Last year was an early season. Usually we see a lot of activity in you know, December, January, February of influenza. COVID, um, we're, we're, we're seeing seasonal trends. And so we expect uh, as we're indoors more, breathing the same air, that there will be more COVID cases as well. And RSV is very predictably a winter virus. So we're concerned about RSV starting now into the middle of winter. Are there any shortages of vaccines, doctor, that we should be concerned about? No shortages. No shortages That's of vaccines news, yeah. this year. So I encourage everybody to go get one. Mm -hmm. So we're heading into a holiday week. Is it too late for people to get vaccines now that will help them at that family gathering for Thanksgiving? 
It really is. It's too late to get a, a vaccine now to protect you during Thanksgiving, but it would be a great time to get one to protect you during gatherings uh, in December. You know, family gatherings are on Christmas and the New Year. Um, you want to get a vaccine about two weeks before you might be exposed to something for it to be effective. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that COVID vaccines the, are recommended for everyone. Uh, the people who had the initial sequence and or have had COVID, do they still have any immunity from COVID or has it really morphed to the point where um, that doesn't really protect you anymore? Um, that's a somewhat complicated question. They have some protection, but uh, COVID has mutated so quickly that the virus that's circulating now is different than the original strain. So our updated booster vaccine, the current one that's available, is targeted toward what's circulating now, what's, what's in our community now, which is very different from the initial strain. When you say different, is it more deadly or? No, it's just uh, changed a few of its, um, of its proteins such that our immune system doesn't recognize it as well um, from that initial exposure. Mm. So it's not more serious, but uh, you might have less protection based on your past vaccine or your past infection. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So as a, as a physician and in the medical community, um, is, the, is COVID still a greater concern than the regular seasonal flu or has it morphed to the point where it, it's pretty much the same? Mm, that's a good question. <laughs> um, it, uh, they're both of significant concern to me. I, I'm not gonna rank them in order. Uh, <laughs> But COVID is, it's still very significant. There's still a lot of deaths due to COVID. There are hospitalizations due to COVID. It certainly hasn't gone away. Um, so we, I still take it very seriously. Are large numbers of people getting vaccinated? No, it's actually somewhat disappointing. Really? Um, with, our, with our recent booster vaccine, a relatively small percentage of Americans are getting vaccinated. Um, and my hope is for those who are at higher risk, those over 60 or 65, or those who have immune compromising conditions, okay. if they get it. Dr. Andrew Thompson, time. thank you very kindly. Appreciate you being with us tonight. Happy to be here. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Well, it's time now for Voices of the Region when we hear from a local journalist about topics in the news. Joining us this time is Aaron Brown, an author, columnist, and journalism instructor from rural Itasca County. Recently, there was a major fire in downtown Eveleth and one of the uh, historic brick buildings in, in that range town uh, burned, had to be actually demolished in the process of uh, the fire uh, suppression. Um, it was, of course, these old buildings are often right next to each other in these downtowns. And so it was um, a, more than a dozen, uh, maybe even 20 fire departments uh, came in to help address the, the, the fire. It's an apartment building now, and um, I bring it up because in the process of fighting this particular fire, the uh, fire departments of the local towns had to truck in water to help keep up with the demand for water at the mouth of the hoses uh, going into the, into the flames. A lot of these towns and their 100-year-old infrastructure are going to be called upon to fight big fires. And I think that's something that um, all the local towns will be paying attention to. Whenever you see something like this in action, it sometimes causes um, strategies to change as, uh, as fire departments think of how to handle this in the future. There were school referendums that failed all across, especially North Central Minnesota. And um, the one in Duluth passed, but the second one failed. And as we look at these referendums failing at a much higher rate than passing in this last go around, we, we realize or should that uh, support for taxation for education right now is probably 
lower than it had been. Um, there were a number of reasons. Of course, the, this referendum in Grand Rapids failed badly, 25% for, 75% against. And there's a variety of reasons. Some interesting um, groups came together to oppose the, the referendum. Of course, people who don't like taxes is always a, a, a you know, are a big factor in, in the no vote on a, on a race like that. But I think a lot of people also felt that there had been too much, uh, too many other taxes passed recently. And, and uh, with the high, um, the, the valuation increase that Itasca County had seen in all of its property, I think people felt like there, they, a lot has been going out the door. And um, so it's interesting how voters, they don't necessarily differentiate between school board and county and, and local um, a tax a referenda. They, they see it as all part of their pocketbook. And in this instance, the Grand Rapids School District came up short um, at a time when, you know, they've got a lot of... Um, bills coming due and so there's going to be some major cuts and we're seeing that in other districts across minnesota uh, where referendums have failed if you've been following labor news you know that the united auto workers have, were on strike an extended strike against american automakers and uh, this strike was successful it led to uh, some really good contracts for the uaw and uh, kind of a historic win for legacy labor organization, uh, but it wasn't universally loved by all. Uh, for one thing, um, the automakers are going to be paying uh, their workers a little bit more, but with that, um, Cleveland Cliffs are the biggest uh, mining company in Minnesota right now, uh, and, and steel making company, uh, opted to raise its flat rolled steel prices once again. It's been steadily raising prices uh, since the COVID uh, days. And in fact, they're, they're dealing with some very high prices right now. That is directly coming out of the auto market. So the automakers uh, seeing that news coupled with their labor news came out and uh, issued a statement that they are going to oppose or fight Cliffs's efforts to buy US steel, which is of course, the historic big steel company in America, now no longer the biggest steel maker or even the biggest in Minnesota, but still a very important company that is essentially for sale. Cliffs wants it, ArcelorMittal, the global uh, steel making giant wants it, and there are some other bidders. And I'm hearing that uh, those bidders uh, are submitting their bids even as we speak and that their representatives uh, under non-disclosure agreements, of course, um, have toured US steel facilities across the country, including here in Northern Minnesota. And so as this is happening, I wouldn't be surprised if we have some big news about US steel before the end of the year. Two native artists work is on display during November and December at the American Indian Community Housing Organization building on West 2nd Street in Duluth. PBS North videographer A.J. Larson talked with the artists for this story. We are at the ECHO Galleries, uh, Robert Powell's Art Gallery, and the uh, name of the art exhibit is Mazini Bi Ige We Niniwuk, which means two woodland artists. And I'm excited to be here with Gordon Coons. He's a seasoned artist. I'm a digital artist. I've been an artist for a long time. And of course, I didn't have digital art back in the day. And primarily, you start out drawing, painting. From there, years later, got into uh, computer graphics. You know, I have a lot of floral designs in my work and there's a lot of four-legged relatives of ours, you know, the bear, the eagle, bullhead, and the moose. I uh, do use planes, geometry, geometric designs as well. I use both because I'm a, also a Dakota uh, um, lineage and also an Ojibwe artist. So a lot of the stuff uh, I use is, is, a, is a dual sort of uh, imagery with uh, woodland and uh, plains art. You know, I grew up on the reservation. We used to make art, we used to give it away. So I would see it being made around my aunts, my uncles would be making things. And I've been traveling around the country for maybe uh, 30 years. I never went to art school. I went to high school and then that's where I got all my art training. My uh, images are pulled from my heritage. Uh, we call it Gijibajanomen. 
we tell stories. So each of our artwork that we create, not only myself, but other Native artists will pull information from their, you know, their stories from their history. Some of my work is more of a historical point to them that, uh, you know, has passed, but a lot of them is our clan stories and you'll see them on my images. I do reduction block prints, create them, I paint in uh, a woodland art style. I have an image in the back that I have done with duct tape and I have some images that are just embossed uh, paper. I have one that I did with duct tape and that's just a little bit more modern. It's a, it's a Superman type character and if you look at him, you'll see that on his name instead of having an S, I use the word NDN. So if you say that fast, what do you get? You get Indian. So that's kind of what I'm trying to do is let the kids know that we're not stuck in the past. We can go forward and that hero person is who they are. Well, most of my work has to do with, uh, you know, historical events. And one thing in those images, I want people to understand that this is what we built the country. We gave uh, land. What really um, I enjoy sharing is seeing people's pride in viewing Anishinaabe art forms. They look at it and say, this is where I come from. This is who I am. These art forms represent my people. At the beginning of a season filled with charitable giving, nonprofits and companies across the Northland are banding together to assist those in need. Our team spoke with folks at Midstate Trucking to learn more about their Truckers for Tots initiative and how community members can get involved. for Tots, so this started about 15 years ago uh, we're with Mid-State Truck Service. We're a family-owned company out of Wisconsin. Originally, we have six stores in Wisconsin we've been doing this with. Uh, when we moved up here, this will be our fourth year now for Minnesota, between Duluth and uh, Virginia, Minnesota. And so I'm on uh, the spearhead of this to help raise money and funds and toys for our local charity for Toys for Tots. Our promotion is Truckers for Tots, obviously and uh, Salvation Army has helped us logistically with delivering toys and getting toys out for us. So it's been a great, real great situation for our community here. Uh, this last year I was told by uh, our Toys for Tots rep that we equated for over 50% of the total toys collected and distributed last year. So we're looking to up that ante this year. Uh, last year I think we spent roughly about $16,000 at Fleet Farm locally. Uh, they've been a great, uh, a great partner with this as well. They offer a discount for us to come there and shop as well as donate to the project as well. So it's been a really good situation. Our shopping date this year is gonna be the 28th of November. Uh, we'll be up at, at Fleet Farm and we'll have a big huge trailer up there and have, be loading everything up. And then the following day, we'll be down at the local Salvation Army on 27th Street to do distribution. This year we are trying to top $65,000 or better. And so the biggest thing that I can just say is we need the, the community's help. And whether that's $5 or $500 or $5,000, we need your help to, to make that make that a possibility. So like I say, we try to take all the pain points out of it for people. If you want to donate, you just want to be able to come in and drop a check off and let us do the hard stuff, we'll do it. This fall has been a busy one here at PBS North, especially when it comes to local productions. On November 30th, the station will premiere its newest documentary, On By, a film that follows four mushers on the Bear Grease Trail. It brings audiences to behind the scenes moments from checkpoint to checkpoint. And tonight we have an exclusive clip from the film. Let's take a look. Start is coming up at 10 o'clock this morning. First checkpoint is Highway 2, just outside of Two Harbors. First musher should be there about 12 noon this afternoon. Then Finland at 5 p.m. this afternoon and evening. Sawville, early tomorrow morning, under the cover of darkness, and just before 3.30. Finishing at the Grand Portage Lodge and Casino at approximately 4 p.m. Tuesday afternoon, I can tell you that the race course is in great condition, and the times are because of the cold and the dogs.
Love you. Love you. Love you. And now before we leave you this week, we want to tell you about the end of an era here at Almanac North. After more than 30 years as the co-host of our show, Julie Zenner is retiring at the end of December. Now back when she started hosting the show in 1993 with Jack Sutherland, Julie was a full-time employee of PBS North, working on documentaries and doing stories for the Venture North series. And then in 1997, Darren Danielson joined the team and co-hosted with Julie for more than 14 years. Now during that time, Julie was a constant for the program each and every week. And then in 2011, I had the honor of taking this seat next to Julie, and 12 years seemed to have passed in the blink of an eye. And so I ask you, Julie, what makes this the right time to step away from Almanac North? Well, first of all, I'm, I'm really excited about this, but it also a little bit bittersweet, too, because I, this has been so much a part of my life. But you mentioned in the, in the introduction 30 years, and I was 29 years old when I took over the seat here at Almanac North. 30 years later, it just kind of seems like a nice round number and thought that this would be a, a good way to wrap it up. And yet you kept coming back for 30 years. I did, I did. What, what, what drove you? Well, there were quite a few things that, that drove me, um, besides the fame and fortune, of course, you know, that, which <laughs> is, is just a given. Uh -huh. <laughs> I really have enjoyed um, doing the show, having an opportunity to meet some of the, the newsmakers from around the area, get a, a chance every week to, to learn about a topic, yeah. to, to talk with them in an in-depth for, format where they can give their perspectives um, they can give their opinions, and sometimes they can be uh, challenged mm -hmm. to, to defend those positions. I, I think that's part of our role here. So I've really, really enjoyed that. And then also the opportunity to uh, work with people like you. I, you, know, you saw the, well, you saw and you were part of that litany of uh, great journalists that I've been able to work with over the, the course of the years. It has just been uh, a real gift to sit next to you, to sit next to Darren, to sit next to Jack Sutherland. Um, you're all just consummate professionals and really consider each and every one of you um, my friend too. And then in addition to that, um, Greg Grell behind the scenes. Greg mm -hmm. has been the producer of Almanac North since day one. And um, he's really the, the glue that kind of keeps the whole show together. And we've grown up together. Yeah. Um, Greg also is planning to retire at the end of this yes, year. Yes, he is. So, so this is just a real kind of neat package of closure, I think, for, for the two of us and an opportunity to, to move forward. But I'm really excited that you're going to be sticking with the next iteration of Almanac North. I, I will be, and, um, uh, and we'll see what that's going to be like, but I'm going to stay around for a while. Well, I, that's great because you, you have such a way with, uh, with the news. You have such a way of making people comfortable. Uh, and how are great. you going to be spending your free time, Julie? Lots of things planned. Um, grandkids. I have grandkids. Two two beautiful grandkids and one on the way. I um, have a, a freelance writing business that I'm going to keep doing for uh, a few business clients. And over the past 15 years or so, I've also developed some skills as a potter. Uh, so I'm going to be uh, continuing to yeah. make pottery, sell pottery, and and just really enjoy life out on the farm that we bought a couple. Well, of it's years been an ago. absolute thrill sitting here with you. Thank you. Thank you. you bet. I really appreciate it. 
Well, we're out of time, but you can keep up with Almanac North by following us on Facebook and X. Keep an eye on the PBS North website for program updates, news about the station, and our upcoming events. And don't forget to download the PBS video app to watch your favorite PBS programs on demand. And Danny, ready or not, Thanksgiving and the rest of the holidays are straight ahead. I am ready. Are you ready? I guess so. I'm hungry. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm transporting my, my turkey to my daughter's house. Wonderful. So are, Good for you. We are ready to go. And a program note, we will be off next week for mm -hmm. the holidays, so our next show will be on Friday, December 1st. For Dennis Anderson and the crew at Almanac North, I'm Julie Zenner. Have a great Thanksgiving. We'll see you next time.